past history will be repeated. In other words, the past history of Israel, the Israel church, will be repeated. Now tell me, in the time of Christ, the Jews or Israel of that day, though they complained much about Rome, they joined with Rome for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the true foundation. Past history will be repeated. How sad, but true. And this is love, that we walk after His commandments. Do you love Jesus enough to live for Him, to obey His law? The truths that are to stamp their impress upon the characters of all Seventh-day Adventists. Your leader, and by reference here, that would be Dr. Kellogg. Your leader has been removing the foundation timbers one by one. And his reasoning would soon leave us with no certain foundation for our faith. He has not heeded the testimonies, that would be the spirit of prophecy, that God through His Spirit has given. Now, I want to interrupt before we continue with this quote. I want to interrupt there for a moment and just ask you the question. Is modern Israel today, the modern health system today, doing any better than Kellogg did then? Are they heeding those testimonies, the spirit of prophecy, or have they thrown it out into the trash heaps? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning just thanking you and praising you for leading and guiding and directing. We pray, Father, that you will be with us, that your Holy Spirit will dwell with us, and that you will set a hedge of angels about us as we work to share the gospel with others. May we be found each one faithful. Open our understanding in the word of truth today and send your blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to study this morning about the seven essentials of holy living and the Holy Spirit and how they work together. Let us go to our Bibles to Matthew. We want to go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. And it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now this is a command given to us from Jesus. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. 
A perfect character is the goal. Now I know many today don't believe or agree with that. But the Bible says, be therefore perfect, and often it's said, well, I can't, or there's excuses made. But let's look at this carefully. God has devised a redemption plan, and that redemption plan has provided for ways and means to, um, it is full and complete with infinite resources, power to meet every great and minute need for the changing of men and women back into the perfect likeness of his own character. See, when we, when our ancestors, as in Adam and Eve, sinned, humanity lost that perfection. And in order for us to be reunited with God and heaven, we must again regain that perfection, that Christ-likeness of character. The issue is we cannot of ourselves do it. It is impossible. And that is why Christ has come for us to this earth to make a way of correcting <coughs> these things. Human experience, as recorded in the scriptures, indicated, indicates that man is prone to doubt that the plan of redemption is for character development. Many become confused in their ideas of how to receive the provisions of the gospel and let them operate in their life for a perfect transformation. Man's own experience has always been the greatest problem. This is the battle of self that every one of us face today. There are no exemptions. How shall we relate ourselves to our Maker so that the provisions of the Gospel shall operate within us? What is the experience through which a sinner is to pass by, which they become again a child of God? And to be saved in the kingdom of heaven? How shall man receive the power of God to enable them to live a holy life? These are the greatest questions of the world, the greatest questions men can ask. And the problem involved is the greatest which has confronted mankind in all ages. To reach this goal should be the first aim of life of all people, members of all religious faiths, but more especially those who are looking for Christ's soon return and raise the righteous dead and translate the living saints who have gained the victory over all sin. Let's go to our Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we want to start with verse 52. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. Blessed are they 
that do his commandments and they that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And Revelation 14, 12, which says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And now let's go to 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, which says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And then in 1 John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 through 3, 1 John chapter 1, or excuse me, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Take note there in verse 3, it tells us that we are to purify ourselves. And yet of ourselves we cannot and so there is a work, a process. So now let's look at the spirit of prophecy, a few comments on these texts that we just went through. Testimonies, volume 4, page 429, paragraph 2. Testimonies, volume 4, page 429, paragraph 2. In heaven there is perfect order, perfect obedience perfect peace and harmony. Those who have had no respect for order or discipline in this life would have no respect for the order which is observed in heaven. They never, they can never be admitted to heaven, for all worthy of entrance there will love order and respect discipline. In other words, therefore, there are no exemptions, there are no excuses. Age, um, sex, um, whatever circumstance, there are no exceptions. Only in heaven it is perfect obedience. Perfect obedience. Going on with our quote, the characters formed in this life will determine the future destiny. The characters formed in this life, right now, will determine the future destiny of us, that is. Going back to the quote. When Christ shall come, he will not change the character of any individual. So in other words, if you're a liar here, you would be a liar in heaven if you go or uh, were allowed to be there, but of course you will not be allowed to be there. So that means you cannot be a liar here. And that goes on with all of the other things that God has specifically given us instruction about. Precious probationary time, we're back to our quote, precious probationary time is given to be improved in washing our robes of character and making them white in the blood of the Lamb. To remove the stains of sin requires the work of a lifetime. Every day renewed efforts in restraining and denying self are needed. Every day there are new battles to fight and victories to be gained. Every day the soul must or the soul should be called out in earnest pleading with God for the mighty victories of the cross. On to another reference, Signs of the Times, September 18, 1879, paragraph 5. That's Signs of the Times, September 18, 
1879, paragraph 5. We believe without a doubt that Christ is soon coming. This is not a fable to us. It is a reality. We have no doubt, neither have we had a doubt for years, that the doctrines we hold today are present truth and that we are preparing for the judgment. We are preparing to meet him who is to appear in the clouds of heaven with the holy retinue of angels, to escort him on his way, to give the faithful, the, the just, the finishing touch of immortality. Immorality. Sorry. No, immortality. Got it right the first time. Um, to give the faithful and the just the finishing touch of immorality. Immortality. When he comes, he is not to cleanse us of our sins. He is not then to remove from us the defects in our character. He will not then cure us of the infirmities of our tempers and dispositions. He will not do this work then. Before that time, this work will, be, will all be accomplished if wrought for us at all. <coughs> then those who are holy will be holy still. They are not to be made holy when the Lord comes. Those who have preserved their bodies and their spirits in holiness and in sanctification and honor will then receive the finishing touch of immortality. And when he comes, those who are unjust and unsanctified and filthy will remain so forever. There is then no work to be done for them which shall remove their defects and give them holy characters. The refiner does not then sit to pursue his refining process and remove their sins and their corruption. This is all to be done in these hours of probation. It is now that this work is to be accomplished for us. To one more reference with this, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 466. That's Testimonies, Volume 5, page 466, paragraph 2. It is a solemn thing to die, but a far more solemn thing to live. Every thought and word and deed of our lives will meet us again. Did you hear that? Every thought and every word and every deed of our lives will meet us again. Every thought and every word and deed of our lives will meet us again. What we make of ourselves in probationary time that we must remain, um, that we must remain to all eternity. Death brings dissolution to the body, but makes no change in the character. The coming of Christ does not change our characters. It only fixes them forever beyond all change. So, therefore... If our characters are not changed now in this probationary time, they will not be changed at a later time. Now, I know it's often um, people make excuses why they cannot change. And there's many, many excuses. And there's no need in talking about all of the excuses, for that will be no help to any of us. The point is, God does not accept any excuse. Our characters must change and be corrected now in this probationary time. The heart or character is changed by seven points. And this is really the heart of our study today. These seven points. And we're going to do a quick review of these seven points. So pen and paper handy. Point number one is prayer. Point number two is faith. Point three, study of the Word of God. Point four, the gospel of health. Point five, Christian education. 
point six is sacrifice. And point seven is Christian service. Now I'm going to go through those again for those of you that may be taking notes. But we're going to go a little more quickly because we've got a lot of material to cover yet. Number one, prayer. Number two, faith. Number three, the study of the Word of God. Number four, the gospel of health. Number five, Christian education. Number six, sacrifice. And number seven, Christian service. So the Holy Spirit works through these seven essential points. Today there is much confusing confusion concerning the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit is to do for Christians is one of those confusing points. Who is the Holy Spirit is another one of those confusing points. How is this how the Spirit may be received in larger measure is another of those confusing points. And yet another is when is it time that the latter rain or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will happen? That is greatly being discussed right now. And in the process of the majority of people asking these questions, they're all looking the wrong direction for the wrong answers and they are not finding the truth. Therefore, they are believing a lie. So let's look at this, the work of the Holy Spirit through these seven essential points. See, the point is, it doesn't matter who the Holy Spirit is. It matters that He is there, or it is there, and it is working on us. That's the important part. The meaning and the place of the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. So, in this study, as we're looking at this, we understand that there are fruits of the Spirit and there are gifts of the Spirit. We need to get this in its proper order. For many try to go to, they want to skip over the fruits, and we'll talk more about fruits in a moment and explain, and they try to go to the gifts of the Spirit and they try to skip the fruits. The problem is they've taken it all out of order. What relation does the Holy Spirit sustain to man's use of these seven means? Let it be understood now that these means, these seven points, are not in opposition to the Holy Spirit. And they are not a substitute for its work. Neither can the work of the Holy Spirit be made a substitute for them. But rather, the Holy Spirit uses these seven means, these seven operations, and He operates, the Holy Spirit operates through them, through these seven points. Let's look at them. Number one, prayer and the Holy Spirit. We quote, this is Christ Object Lessons, page 147. Just one short sentence. We must not only pray in Christ's name, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And going to our Bibles, and I'm going to just quote from the texts that I have on my screen. Some of them I have paraphrased. Some of them I am quoting. I'm going to give you the references, you can look it up, but I'm going to go this way for the sake of time today. So Jude, chapter 1, of course, there's only one chapter, verse 29 and verse 31. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Therefore, it is that prayer and the Holy Spirit do not operate separately. 
for our spiritual growth. But unitedly, for the Spirit is teaching us how to pray. If we seek to separate the two, we will destroy the work of both. Furthermore, the attitude in prayer must be that of definite surrender of everything in the life to the Spirit, which is summed up in the phrase, Thy will be done. It is useless for us to pray in any other way. The Holy Spirit and the principle of surrender govern what we say. The degree of surrender determines how much we are blessed through prayer. Are we willing to surrender to the Holy Spirit? Or is there too much self in our lives keeping the Holy Spirit pushed back? Prayer cannot be a substitute for the Spirit, nor the Spirit for prayer. Prayer, surrender, and the Spirit, a divine trio, prayer, surrender, and the Holy Spirit are a divine trio working together for our transformation. This may sound too simple to occupy our time in this study. But the meaning is mighty, and the meaning will become more apparent as we proceed. Prayer, surrender, and the Holy Spirit working together for our salvation. Working together to change our lives. Moreover, to yield to the Spirit's call to prayer is one item in the total experience of surrender to Him. We do not surrender to God all in one bound, but item by item, day by day, each battle, victory upon victory, building and building, as we pass through life's daily experiences. We do not come to the place where we make a great surrender, but after that there may be occurrences every hour of the day which call for new or more complete surrender. So we don't just surrender once, all done, finished. This is a ongoing day by day work. As we gain one victory, we open up that door that the Holy Spirit may come in a bit more fully into our lives to help us gain that victory, in this case with point one, essential point one, through prayer, gaining that victory in our lives so that we can be overcomers. Let us go to point number two, faith and the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 says, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. We all have a measure of faith. Do we want that faith to grow? If that faith is to grow, we have to use it and we have to allow the Holy Spirit to help us so that that faith day by day can grow our trust in God. 1 Corinthians 12, 9, to another faith by the same Spirit. So in other words, this measure of faith is given through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit adds our faith. As it begins to grow, more of that Holy Spirit is within us. Therefore, faith and the Spirit do not operate separately. For our development, but unitedly, 
the Spirit is imparting the faith and urging us to believe God. If we seek to separate them, we destroy the work of both. The attitude that we sustain to faith must be of divine or definite surrender. The attitude we sustain to faith must be that of definite surrender to everything in life contrary to faith in Christ. It is useless to try to exercise faith apart from each surrender. This is why we have Christians who are sinning still. Why they have a profession, but there seems to be no change in the life. Now we may look at ourselves and we may go, I'm striving, I strive, I struggle daily. The problem is we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us for a greater faith. We're on a work self-help program. And that has to change. If we want final, pure, true victory, we have to have that Holy Spirit of truth working within us. And as we gain those victories step by step, we are accepting more and more each day of that Holy Spirit. Faith cannot be substituted for the Spirit, nor the Spirit for faith. Faith, surrender, and the Spirit form another trio, working together for our salvation. Faith, surrender, and the Holy Spirit, another trio, working together that we can have salvation. The Spirit is always trying to get us to believe in God and His Word, but it is natural for us to doubt. When it says, be um, not faithless, but believing, if we say, Verily, very well, Lord, I accept the lesson the Spirit comes into the heart in a larger measure. But if we reply, I cannot accept the lesson, it is too hard, I cannot understand it, I cannot see where it will lead me, then the Spirit remains away and we suffer the loss. Point three, the study of the Word and the Holy Spirit. The study of the Word and the Holy Spirit. Let's go to our Bibles, John chapter 14. Verse 26, John 14, 26. The Spirit teaches the Word. Quote, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The study of the Word and the Holy Spirit. Let's now go now to John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. 1 John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20 and 27. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and 27. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
So the Spirit teacheth us all we ever learn from the Word of God. Do you see why the importance that we pray before we go to the Word of God and open the Word of God to read? If we open the Word without prayer, we have not invited the Holy Spirit to work with us and to teach us the meanings in the Word of Truth. We are attempting of ourselves to understand without the Spirit of Truth. Our approach to the study of the Bible and the testimonies must always be with a readiness to yield to the will of God as soon as it is discovered. Now that point there, I want you to pay special heed to. For to begin at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and to read through to Revelation chapter 22 to the end thereof will not be a benefit to us if, number one, we do not ask the Holy Spirit in prayer to be our teacher, but more so than that, if when we read those truths and we discover those things, we do not apply them here to our lives. If we do not apply the will of God, His Word, His will for us in our lives, it is of no value and you have wasted your time in the reading of it. We must surrender to the Word of God. Not making excuses as some do and go, Oh, I think maybe that was changed. That really couldn't be. Or, well, <clears throat> that was Paul and that was just his opinion that has nothing to do with us today. We cannot do that. It is here. We either need to accept it as a whole or we need to reject it entirely. For to do anything other in between, we have literally rejected it. We have to, we must accept it as a whole. We must surrender to what we have learned and our readiness to yield to what we have learned will determine to a large extent how much the Spirit will reveal to us. So when we begin to surrender and to accept the word that says that I am a sinner in need of a Savior, the Holy Spirit then begins to come in. And as I read, and as you read, more things will then, our eyes, our understanding will be opened up. And we will see more things. We will understand more the word of truth. The study of the Word cannot be substituted for the work of the Spirit, nor the work of the Spirit for the study of the Word. The study of the Word and surrender to it, the work of the Spirit forms still another divine trio, working together for our salvation. The Spirit is ever calling us to more faithful study of the Word of God and to a more complete acceptance of it. If we neglect its admonition to study or to our own and read other writings which God has provided for our salvation, the Spirit turns away and waits for us to heed the call. And we have less of the presence than we might have. So, in other words, what I'm telling you this morning is if we read the word of truth, whether it be the spirit of prophecy or whether it be the scriptures, and we apply it to others, or we don't apply it at all, or we give excuses why that is not for us, 
then the Holy Spirit is driven from us further and further and further away. So we must accept those things, we must surrender to those points, and we must make those changes in our life so that the Holy Spirit will become more and more and fill us. Let's go to our next point, point number four, the gospel of health and the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to our Bibles again, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? So, simply put, plain English today. Whatever I put in here, if it destroys this body temple, it pushes away the Holy Spirit, and God then will destroy me if what I put in here is pushing away and is destroying this temple. Conversely, if what I put in here is to build and to strengthen this body temple, according to the Word of God, and then the Holy Spirit is drawn in closer. And this Holy Spirit then convicts us as we begin to leave off some of these different things in our diet, as we separate from these things that are harmful to us, we leave them off, and the Holy Spirit then says, Ah, oh, okay, so you've left away this, that is good. Now, let me bring this to your attention, because this is not good either. And step by step, we begin to purify this temple. Let's go to our next verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit which are, are God's. The Holy Ghost. So, again, we are either accepting or rejecting the Holy Spirit into our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let us cleanse ourselves. Now, we talked about this actually this morning a bit earlier with diet and with cleansing. Let me reiterate this in a simple as way as possible. There are many cleansing ways that we can cleanse ourselves. Going to eat two meals a day is a cleansing fast. And I've had people tell me, oh, Yes, I only eat two meals a day, and yet I see them snacking all day long. That's not two meals a day. That's one meal a day. That's all day. Just because you don't sit at a table in front of a great big plate full or platter full of food doesn't mean that you are not eating or having a meal. When it's going in here, you are eating, that is a meal. And if you eat constantly, as some do, as I once did many years ago, we are not cleansing ourselves from the defilement, but we are going against the clear word of God Amen. and doing our own way. These scriptures make it clear that the gospel of health and the spirit are fellow workers. That they do not work separately upon us, but unitedly 
this cleansing of the body includes healthful living. Now going to the Spirit of Prophecy for a bit more information on this, let's go to Testimonies Volume 1. Testimonies Volume 1, page 486, paragraph 2. That's Testimonies Volume 1, page 486, paragraph 2. The health reform I was shown is part of the third angel's message, and it is just as closely connected with it as are the arm and the hand with the human body. I saw that as that we as a people must make an advanced move in this great work. Ministers and people must act in concert or together. God's people are not prepared for the loud cry of the third angel. They have a work to do for themselves which they should not leave for God to do for them. Now, I want to comment on this before we continue with our quote here, because just recently I was talking with a gentleman and he was asking me if I had heard about the, all the questions of people out there now wanting to know when Revelation 18, the loud cry, the outpouring of the latter rain would go forth. And they are all looking for a sign to know when this will happen. And I think we just read when it will happen. The issue is there is not a sign, and I, oh, I'm sure they'll find or come up with something somehow and twist it enough to make it appear as though they found a sign. But what God is waiting for is He's waiting for us to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to perfect and change our lives so that as the Holy Spirit is added little by little into our lives, we will then will be filled with the Holy Spirit and we will then be able to give the loud cry message. It is not a thing of one day we have not the Holy Spirit and the next day we have a full measure of the Holy Spirit. We must begin with these simple steps of character perfection. Let us go back to our quote. They have a work to do for themselves which they should not leave for God to do for them. He has left this work for them to do, that's us. It is an individual work, one cannot do it for another. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Gluttony is the prevailing sin of this age. Lustful appetite makes slaves of men and women and beclouds their intellects and stupefies their moral sensibilities to such a degree that the sacred elevated truths of God's word are not appreciated. The lower propensities have ruled men and women. The Holy Spirit demands a clean temple to dwell in. The Spirit teaches us out of the Bible and the testimonies what right living is and guides us in the application and the use of its principles. Our issue is we all tend to make a designer religion. We read some little phrase and we adopt it and twist it to what we feel is best for us and make excuses. God's not looking for any more excuses. He's looking for a people that fully want to surrender in every way. If we try to speculate the gospel, excuse me, if we try to separate the gospel of health from the work of the Holy Spirit, we destroy the power of both. Point five, Christian education and the Holy Spirit. Education comes to men through the Spirit. First Corinthians 
chapter 12 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Right there is our scripture proof that Christian education and the Holy Spirit work together. The relation between Christian education and the Spirit has always been definite and clear. Though I'll tell you what, man has done their best to make a muddy mess out of it. The principles of Christian education has always come through the spirit of prophecy. In ancient times, the schools were under the direct supervision of the prophets so that education was directed by the Spirit of God. And today, if the Christian education is proper, it is through the spirit of prophecy. It is not through a university. Therefore, the principles of Christian education and the Holy Spirit do not operate separately for our advancement, but unitedly. The Spirit gives us the principles and directs in their use. If we separate education from the Spirit, we destroy the power of both. The amount of blessing we receive from education depends largely upon how we surrender to the guidance of the Spirit in giving, obtaining, and using it. Even Christian education cannot be made a substitute for the work of the Spirit, nor the work of the Spirit for education. They, with surrender, form another trio of work for our salvation. Christian education, the Holy Spirit, and surrender. Let's go to point number six. Sacrifice and the Holy Spirit. Sacrifice and the Holy Spirit. Under the administration of the Spirit, the believers in Jerusalem in the times of persecution had all things common. You can find proof for that in Acts chapter 4, verse 31 through 35. This one scripture is, is sacrificed to show that the Spirit produces the spirit of sacrifice within us. Therefore, the experience in sacrifice and the work of the Spirit are not operating separately for our spiritual growth, but unitedly. The Spirit would direct in the sacrifice and in the use of the funds and operate upon the giver's heart to make him Christ-like by the acts of sacrifice. How many of us believe that we need to sacrifice at this point of time in history Amen. to finish this work. It seems to me that we all have our own agendas and we are all working in such a way that we are pleasing self instead of sacrificing to see this work finished. If we separate sacrifice from the work of the Spirit and make it mechanically merely, we will destroy the blessing of both. The amount of blessing we receive in Christ's likeness of character through sacrifice depends upon how fully we surrender to the Spirit of Christ in sacrifice and enter into His experience in sacrifice from His standpoint. Sacrifice, therefore, cannot be made a substitute for the work of the Spirit, nor the work of the Spirit for it. Do you see how this Holy Spirit is interrelated with all of these things that we are, these seven steps that we are going through? And without the Holy Spirit working in us 
for these things, they are worthless. And yet the majority of professed Christians today are doing just that. They are working without the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit working in them, they will be lost. You think I'm judging? That's not judging. That's fruit inspecting. These are the fruits of the Spirit that we are talking about. Are they exemplified in your life? Or are they something that you only talk about on a good day? The Holy Spirit uses it as a means to make us Christ-like. He performs the miracle within us when we yield and decide to perform the acts of sacrifice. In other words, when we choose that we are going to sacrifice something out of our life that special dessert maybe or maybe it's that bit of uh, a new hairstyle or maybe it's something else with dress or maybe it's simply something um, that we could live without that we think we need sacrifice as we sacrifice, as we go without, or as we take our funds and the monies that we would like to use for something for ourselves, we give to the work of the Lord. And it is a sacrifice for us to do that. The Holy Spirit comes in and blesses us abundantly. The more we sacrifice, the more blessing we receive. Sacrifice. Do we sacrifice? Or are we doing it in our own way, without the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit uses it to make, uses sacrifice to make us Christ-like. He performs the miracle within us and we yield and decide to perform the acts of sacrifice. We need more of the Spirit. If we hear the Spirit's voice calling to greater liberality, He comes in with a larger measure. If we decline, He remains away. Let's go to point seven. Christian service and the Holy Spirit. Christian service and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8 Verse 26 to 40. And Acts chapter 5. Um, and Acts chapter 16, 6 to 10. The Holy Spirit directs in all manner of service. Christian service and the Spirit do not work separately for us, but unitedly. If we would separate them, we would destroy the work of both. Does that kind of sounding a little repetitious by now? Hopefully you're getting the point. That's why I've written it and reading here is because I want it to be repetitious. I want you to each one see that we cannot separate these things. They work together with the Holy Spirit. The degree to which the Spirit will guide any person in work for others and the amount of blessing in Christ-likeness of character which we receive from the experiences of Christian service depend upon how fully we surrender to the Spirit of Christ in rendering the service. Christian service cannot be made a substitute for the work of the Spirit, nor the work of the Spirit for it, but they with surrender from form another trio. Christian service, the Holy Spirit, and surrender again form another trio, which develop Christ-like character 
within us. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Do you see the importance of Christ's likeness? Christ is yearning over every sinner on earth. That's you and I. And he sends his spirit to all who have light to hasten with it to those who have it now. The neglect to heed this call is one of the greatest sins of Christendom. And if there be at last a church no, known from the prophecies that the end of all things is near, beyond which there will be no more opportunity to be saved, a supreme duty would be heralded, heralded that message would go worldwide. The message that Jesus is soon coming and we must get ready. What do you think it means to get ready but to perfect Christian character? To neglect to do so would largely shut out the spirit and would give us insufficient power to make it possible for us to be overcomers. We would not obtain the victory we must learn that by Christian service, we must be willing to serve others by presenting the gospel message. Now, there are some who may say that, well, Christian service could be doing this or doing that, or I went and helped my neighbor. But did you physically help them or did you spiritually help them? Are you leading them to Christ to the realization that time is almost finished? Or did you just change a light bulb and mow their lawn? There's more to it. Now, light bulbs changed and lawns mowed are important. But all the light bulbs and the lawn mowed in the world is not going to get a person to heaven. The message has to be given that time is almost over, that we must make a change in our lives. So how much of the Holy Spirit do you want? Now it's easy to say, oh, I want to be entirely filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's wonderful. That is perfect. The question is, we just went through the seven steps of how that Holy Spirit fills us. Are you willing to follow those seven steps? Or are you just wanting somebody to wave their magic wand and you suddenly have the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling in you? I think that's the majority of Christendom today. They're looking for that magic wand. They're not willing to surrender, as we've been talking about. Each person has a working in his heart and life as much as the Spirit as he desires. So in other words, the Spirit coming into our heart, our lives, changing our character is only allowed to be there as much as we allow it by following these seven steps. The Holy Spirit is about each person, like the atmospheric pressure, trying to find a way in. He will come in and take possession just to the extent you yield to His voice and receive His counsel. You realize the majority of Christianity today are taking the counsel of, the, of other men, of women, of friends, of family, of anything besides listening and taking the counsel of the Holy Spirit. They not, do not want the pure word of truth. They are by this rejecting the Holy Spirit the teacher of all truth. 
Will we surrender? You make the decision and you take the consequences. It's your choice. A few scriptures which discuss the work of the Holy Spirit will now be studied that we may understand that throughout the Bible the work of grace carried on by the Spirit is not done independently of these seven means, these seven points that we've been looking at. That we, um, these things that we've been dis discussing, but that the Spirit works through these channels. And that when we read the Scripture promises of the work of the Spirit upon our individual hearts to make us Christ-like, we should understand them. John chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. John chapter 3 verses 1 to 8 give us the experience of the new birth does not come through the Spirit apart from prayer, faith, Bible study, etc., but in connection with them. So John chapter 3 verses 1 to 8 teaches us that the Spirit does not come separate from prayer, faith, Bible study, etc. Philippians 2, 13. God does not work. I think it's 1 to 13. I made, mismade my note there. God does not work to will and to do in us by His Spirit apart from these seven means, but rather through them. Galatians 2.20 Christ liveth in me. By His Spirit, working in connection with all these delegated agencies we have been studying. Romans 8, 4 tells us we walk after the Spirit as He pilots us in the reception and use of the means of grace God has appointed. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 24, the Holy Spirit will bear His fruits in our individual lives if we yield fully to Him and follow His leading in the use of every means of grace God has given. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25 and 26, we will live by the Spirit when every act, thought, and plan of life is shaped by the Spirit as He indicts our prayers, inspires our faith, teaches us the Word, guides us in following the laws of health, directs in education, has His way in sacrifice, and leads in Christian service. The principles are beautifully summarized in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. I hope you take the time to look it up and read that this afternoon. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, where it is said that God has given us, given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, and that by these means we might be partakers of the divine nature, that if we do these things ye shall never fall, but that if we give diligence to these things we shall make our calling and election sure, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thus God wondrously provided for complete restoration of his, his likeness in man. Every passage in the Bible and every passage of the testimonies concerning the Holy Spirit presents it as the great essential to success in the Christian experience. 
and over and over again we are urged to seek and pray for it. When we do so, for what sort of manifestation of it should we seek? Answer. The answer is simply this. Usually not for its connection with prayer, faith, the study of the word, healthful living, education, sacrifice, or service for the development of a perfect character. Victory over sin is to come first. We cannot have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit until we have victory over sin. The gifts of the Spirit and the outpouring of the latter rain come later. This matter has been made very plain in the guiding literature of the Spirit of Prophecy. Some of the instruction I'm going to share with you now as we finish up our study. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 619, paragraph 1. one. I was shown that if God's people make no efforts on their part, but wait for the refreshing to come upon them and remove their wrongs and correct their errors if they depend upon that to cleanse them from the filthiness of the flesh and fit them to engage in the loud cry of the third angel, they will be found wanting. The refreshing or power of God comes only on those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God bids them. That's what we've been talking about, these seven points, working unitedly in trio with the Holy Spirit. Back to our quote. Um, the refreshing or the power of God comes only on those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God bids them, namely cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 225, paragraph 1. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 225, Paragraph 1. If they will not be purified through obeying the truth and overcome their selfishness, their pride, and evil passions, the angels of God have their charge. They are joined to their idols, let them alone. And they pass on to their work, leaving them with their evil traits unsubdued to the control of evil angels. And I would like to, before I finish this quote, I'd like to bring this a little closer to home. If they, that is, if we, if we will not be purified by obeying the truth, if the angels of God are instructed to leave those who are not willing to be purified by the truth but are continually making excuses for their inability to perfect Christian character then we must do as the angels do and leave and separate from them. For if we remain with them we will be lost with them. Back to our quote, those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will be fitted by the latter rain for translation. Do you see how the latter rain is for the, of the true witness is fitting us? This is talking about us, each one of us individually. It's not something that happens, poof, and the wand is waved, and you are now have the power and unction of the Holy Spirit. It is by these steps, these character changes in our life, that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. And as we step, each step drawing closer to God, as the Holy Spirit keeps giving us more truth and more light, 
we begin to be more filled with the Holy Spirit until we come to that point that the, the fruits have been fulfilled and then the gifts will be given. But not until. He will give none any of those gifts until the fruits have come to their fulfillment. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 214. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 214, paragraph 2. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. Did you hear that? Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. You see, this is the time of probation. Today is our time of probation. We cannot say, well, I will begin tomorrow because tomorrow never comes. If we are going to choose to follow Christ, we must choose now. We must make that choice now. We cannot put it off till later. We must now accept Him. We must now fully surrender in all seven of these points that we have been discussing. So that as we surrender to these points, the Holy Spirit can then come in step by step further. And it's not a one-time surrender and you're finished. It is a surrender moment by moment, day by day, on all seven of these points. Back to our quote. It is left with us to remedy the defects of our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. You want that latter rain? You best get busy and start working now so that the Spirit can come and dwell within. Let's go to pamphlet 130, paragraph 12. Pamphlet 130, paragraph, or excuse me, page 12, paragraph 2. Pamphlet 130, page 12, paragraph 2. The Spirit can never be poured out upon us while variance and bitterness towards one another is cherished by the members of the church. Envy, jealousy, evil surmising, and evil speaking are of Satan, and they effectually bar the way against the Holy Spirit's working. You want the Holy Spirit to work in your life? You better cease with envy, jealousy, evil surmising, evil speaking. For those are Satan's characteristics. They are not of God. They bar the way for the Holy Spirit to live and to work within us. Who are you choosing? Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. What spirit? Are you asking to come and fill you when these characteristics are expressed in your life? Review and Herald, December 16, 1884, paragraph 23. That's Review and Herald, December 16, 1884, paragraph 23. When we will bring our hearts into unity with Christ and our lives into harmony with His work, the Spirit that descended on the day of Pentecost will fall on us. There it is. You want to know when the loud cry, the Revelation 18, is going to go forth? I just read it. Simple answer. The answer is when we bring our hearts into unity with Christ and our lives into harmony with His work, the Spirit that descended on the day of Pentecost will fall on us. And when it does, the loud cry will go forth, but not until. You want to see Jesus come in your lifetime? Then get up off your couch and get busy. He's waiting for a people to get ready. 
Experience and Views, page 58, paragraph 3. Experience and Views, page 58, paragraph 3. I saw that none could share the refreshing, that is the outpouring of the latter rain, unless they obtain the victory over every besetment, all pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is holy and none but holy beings can ever dwell in his presence. How much Holy Spirit have we? How much love of the world and pride and selfishness have we over how much of the Holy Spirit do we have in our lives? Another reference, Desire of Ages, page 763, paragraph 3. Desire of Ages, page 763, paragraph 3. The warfare against God's law, which was begun in heaven, will be continued until the end of time. Every man will be tested. Obedience or disobedience is the question to be decided by the world, the whole world. All will be called to choose between the law of God and the laws of men. Here the dividing line will be drawn. There will be but two classes. Every character will be fully developed and all will show whether they have chosen the side of loyalty or that of rebellion. Which side have you chosen? Loyalty or rebellion? Now be honest. Be honest with yourselves. It's easy to say that we have chosen the side of Christ, but when our works don't match our profession, it is clear to all where we stand, where we really stand. Let the works match the profession. And one more reference, Christ Object Lessons, page 69, paragraph 1. Christ Object Lessons, page 69, paragraph 1. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Now before we go on with that point, with that reference, think about it. When the fruit, what we're working on here is the fruits of the Spirit. When those fruits are brought forth, when they are complete, immediately He, Jesus, put it, putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. The fruit of the Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit working in these seven ways in our life, each day gaining step by step, we will get no closer. Eventually, someday, there will be enough people that will love Jesus enough to obey Him and to allow the Holy Spirit to work within them so that the censor may be thrown down and this work in this evil way may be finished. Is it our generation? The choice is up to us. He is waiting for a people. Let's go back to our quote. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. The character is changed 
by seven things. Prayer and the Holy Spirit and sacrifice. Or excuse me, but, and, and not sacrifice. I wanted a different word there. Um, and now I suppose I can't see it in my notes here. I'm pulling a blank. Um, surrender. Surrender. Prayer, surrender, and the Holy Spirit make a trio. Faith, surrender, and the Holy Spirit make a trio. The study of the Word of God, surrender, and the Holy Spirit make a trio. The gospel of health and surrender and the Holy Spirit make a trio. Christian education, surrender and the Holy Spirit make a trio. Sacrifice, surrender and the Holy Spirit make a trio. And Christian service and surrender and the Holy Spirit make a trio. Are we willing today to allow prayer, faith, the study of God's word, the gospel of health, Christian education, sacrifice, and Christian service to change our lives with the work of the Holy Spirit in us? That is the question. If we do, if we make that choice, moment by moment, day by day, continuing on, we will have more of that Holy Spirit until we come to that point that those gifts of the Spirit will be given. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in much need of a Savior. Guide us, help us. We need the Holy Spirit to come and to work in our lives as we surrender our evil characters, as we make those changes, the Holy Spirit will be our teacher, our helper, will supply in every need those things to help us come up higher and will begin to fill us more and more each day so that we may reveal those gifts of the Holy Spirit that are so long looked for, for that loud cry message that will then finish the work quickly so that we all may be reunited after so many years of being lost and wandering in a world of sin we may be reunited with our Heavenly Father who has given so much for us. Bless us, guide us, and strengthen us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Not man's applause.